Hey everyone, in this video, I'm gonna be talking about natural selection. So for natural selection, we are looking at organisms that have adaptations, that is physical characteristics, or sometimes even behaviors, that increase an organism's chances of survival and most importantly, reprodu re reproduction. It is critical that you always talk about passing on these favorable adaptations to the next generation when we're talking about evolution. It will always be the environment that determines which adaptations are going to be favored and which ones are putting the organism as a disadvantage. And so because organisms are gonna live in, that co in common environments, eventually they are going to start resembling one another or have characteristics that seem like they're the same. And this brings us to convergent evolution. So due to these similar environmental pressures, organisms will begin to share structures with very common function. But where these structures come from, or the tissue that these structures come from, may not necessarily be the same. So looking at these structures, every single one of these is a wing used for flight. But even though they all have the same function, which is flight, the structure that these came from are entirely different. So for bats, these are actually bones in here, and this is just skin spread over their finger bones. For butterflies and insects, they don't have any bones at all. Instead, they have different proteins that are used to make the wing structure, and the supports are not bone. In the case of birds, this is also wings, and they do have a bone in here, but it's not a bone like it is with the bats where it's got the fingers stretched. It's just the bone that supports all the feathers which are made from modified scales, not skin. And so all three of these have the same structure, but they arrive from different tissues. Issue. So when we're talking about natural selection, there are three types of natural selection that we have that you've learned about. So let's take a look at each one of these. I have here three graphs and this graph is kind of showing the distribution of organisms or traits of the organism. So this would be the average or the middle value. This is the lower extreme. This is the upper extreme. And I've got this drawn three times for the three different types of natural selection. Let's start with this first one and let's look at stabilizing selection. So the way that I have this written is I've got two plus signs indicating that these are favored by natural selection. So in stabilizing selection, it's the middle value that's favored by natural selection. And then I've got two X's here for the extremes, meaning that the lower extreme is selected against and the upper extreme is also selected against. So over time, your population is going to be more focused around the middle value. And so this is what that population would look like. Notice that for um, this blue line here, the base of the uh, data set is much narrower than the original, which is here in red. So the red expanded all the way from tip to tip, but in stabilizing selection, those are selected against, and so you have fewer and fewer of those, and so the base of the stabilizing selection graph is much more narrow than the original graph. Next is disruptive selection. In disruptive selection, it is the opposite of stabilizing selection. In other words, the middle value is the one that's going to be selected against, and the two upper and lower extremes are going to be favored. So when you look at the population after a disruptive selection event, it would look something like this. So notice now you have basically two sections that are the highest, and those are the extremes. Whoops. So both the lower and upper extreme in both these cases for these phenotype are the ones that are favored by natural selection, and so their values increases. However, the middle value, which is somewhere in between them, you'll notice went from here to down here because this is selected against in the environment. This particular model right here, disruptive selection, is the one that is most likely to lead to speciation. That is simply because you'll have one population in extreme over here, one population in extreme over here. 
The last model is what is known as directional selection. And in directional selection, one of the extremes is going to be selected against and the other extreme is going to be favored. So it could actually look in two different ways. So in this first example, let's say that the lower extreme is favorable in the environment. So you'll notice that if the lower extreme is favored in the environment, then the, the, the graph basically shifts to the left with your average being closer to, the, the, the highest average being closer to the lower extreme of your original population. And in the case of when the upper extreme is favored, it would look like this. So you'll see it's the opposite and you have um, the upper extreme, the highest over here towards the upper extreme of what was the original population. A classic example of this is the peppered moth experiment that y'all learned about where you had one phenotype that was favorable. Let's say it is the uh, light colored moths. Um, then during the industrial revolution, when all the lichen was killed off, the white moths became um, easy to be preyed upon. And so the dark uh, moths had the favor. And so our population shifted over in this direction with dark moths being the most prevalent form. Then during the Clean Air Act, the, the, the moths shifted back again to the lighter form. That's it for natural selection. I hope this video was helpful. Thanks for watching. Bye.